Huh, our theme this month has been compassion. And my topic today is compassion in action. Today is the Memorial Day weekend. And the Memorial Day weekend is established specifically to honor our veterans, our veterans who have passed away, not just the ones in combat, but our veterans. Um, and I know that we have a number of veterans who are in the house right now. Could I have the vets stand up? Those of you who are vets, can you stand up? <laughs> Amen. And I'd like to say a particular shout out to the holistic veterans who are here, who are doing a great deal of work, compassion and action. Compassion and action. Um, and, and I say that to say that if you're gonna honor people, like really honor them, and if there's one place in our society where I think we need more compassion and action, that's with our veterans. That's with our veterans. You know, we ask people to do a really tough job that impacts them for the rest of their lives. And there's something that we need to give back. In the reading that we did, From a Strength to Love, it's one of Dr. King's famous speeches and why he called a certain man a fool. There's a line in that that I think is so poignant when he says, to a certain extent, we are all living in the red. When you're in the red from an accounting standpoint, it means you haven't broken even yet. You're in debt. He says that we're internally in the red as we are in debtors, that we are indebted to so many people living and past. I want you to feel that. We are indebted to so many people living and past. There is this idea that we have, particularly in our American psyche, of the individual, the individualist. Like somehow or another, you can pull it yourself up like by your own bootstraps. Well, even if that was so, you didn't even make the boot or the straps. You didn't even make the boot out of straps. That we are all connected to one another. We are all intricately a part of one another. My topic today is compassion in action. Because in my mind, it really doesn't become compassion until there's some kind of action. And that action may even just be something that's happening internally with you, a shift in your own awareness, a shift in your own consciousness. Sympathy says, I feel for you. Empathy says, I feel with you. I feel what you feel. But that doesn't translate to compassion. Just feeling for you or feeling what you're feeling does not translate to compassion. Compassion comes from a different place. Compassion doesn't come from just my feeling for you or feeling about you. Compassion comes from this deep place of the oneness. I go back to this all of the time because this is what ultimately it is all about. Inner light is founded on this concept of the oneness, the oneness, where everything is coming from one source, one power, one energy field manifesting itself in wide variety and diversity. So you look out and you see a redwood tree and you see a gladiola, like with just reference. There's not a different tree for the redwood. There's not a different life for the gladiola. It's one life expressing itself everywhere. There's not a different life in the St. Bernard or the Chihuahua. 
or uh, it, there, there's only one life. There's not a separate air. We're all breathing the same air. We are all under the same sun. There's just the one. But this beautiful thing, this beautiful energy, when it manifests itself, this undifferentiated form and substance, when it comes into the realm of manifestation, it never does the same thing twice. Isn't that extraordinary? This one thing that is the only thing that every time it materializes, it's always unique. There are, new two, there are no two snowflakes alike. Every single human being has their own imprint. Even something as small as your little baby finger, your DNA pattern, nothing is ever repeated twice. Isn't that amazing? And yet we get confused at the variety of this expression and we want to think that it means separate and other things. The one thing is expressing as everything, but because there are so many everys in everything, we forget that there's only one thing. <laughs> I like that. Hope I remember that. The power of rewind, I can hear it later. Yes. This one thing expresses itself as everything, but there's so many everys in everything, we forget that it's all just one thing. Everything comes from the one. Now, our English language is difficult in this because we can't tell the difference between a solitary one or a united one. So we use one for singular and we use one for plural. Are you with me? So, so we, get, we get confused on that sometimes, on what that is. And the answer is all of it. <laughs> there is the one, but that one is the multiple. There is the one, but that one is, in fact, the all. I think I talked about this last week, but I can't talk about it enough because it is at the root of compassion. I have to go back to the root. In scripture, Jesus was asked a question about what were the greatest commandments. They thought that he was going to talk about the laws. They thought that he was going to talk about behavior and activity. They thought that he was going to be talking about ritual and ceremony. That's what he thought that they, he was going to be talking about. What specific things should we be paying the most attention to? And even at that, what we know of as the Ten Commandments that had been given to Moses, we think of them as a bunch of thou shalt not. But they weren't a bunch of thou shalt not. They were communal laws. They were thou shalt not about behavior, but it was so we could stay in these places of compassion with one another. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It's actually thou shalt not murder. If it was actually thou shalt not kill, maybe we wouldn't have war but it was thou shalt not murder. It wasn't thou shalt not lie. Don't bear false witness against thy neighbor. Don't covet thy neighbor's stuff. See, if, if you're bearing false witness against one another, if you are stealing each other's stuff, if you're not honoring each other, there's going to be drama. There's going to be drama up in here. So it wasn't just about controlling you so that you don't do these things. It's so we can live in community. That we can make it through this sojourn together. That that's what we can do. But Jesus' response 
is not a particular behavioral commandment. He says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy strength and all of thy soul and with all of thy mind. This Lord thy God is that oneness that I'm talking about. It is that essence, that energy field. You can call it God. You can call it something. You can call it whatever it is that you want to call it. And this love is the agapeo love, which is the connective love. It's not just a feeling love, but this commandment says, take all of your mind and all of your strength and all of your soul and stay connected to the only thing that is. That's the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is to stay connected to, to be at one with the one. That's the biggest commandment. That's not an activity. That's not a discreet something that you do in a ceremony. This is a way of thinking. This is a way of being. Can you imagine how your life would be if you really used all of your heart, all of your strength, not just give a parcel of it, but if the vast majority, the totality of everything about you was being directed to staying connected to the only thing that is? What would your life be? If your mind wasn't on worry and doubt and fear and separation and otherness and greed and competition and protectiveness and all that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if your energy wasn't even on how can you make your own life happen? How can I hedge ahead? How can I make sure that, that all of my dreams come true and the anxieties that come from that? Just imagine. If all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength was being used to know that you were connected to the only thing that was. And the, outstink, the extension of that. We call it two commandments. But it wasn't given as two commandments. It was given as a single commandment in two parts. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and, and your neighbor as yourself. As an extension out of that, I want you to feel that. This is not a separate commandment. It is not the golden rule. It is not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As wonderful as that is, it isn't that. The golden rule still has the sense of an otherness. There's me, there's you. There's how I treat you, there's how I treat me. Now, there's a lot of truth in that from the standpoint of because there's only one of us here, how I treat you is going to come back on me. And how I treat you is a reflection of how I feel about me. There is truth in that. But this commandment is deeper. To love. This is the agapeo love. This is that oneness love. And we forget that he said equally to love your enemy. You love your enemy, you love your neighbor, you love everybody as though they are you. To love them as yourself, as though they are you. No separation, no otherness. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine for a moment what the world would be like what your life would be like 
If you spent all of your time and your effort and energy in this state of awareness of the oneness, that you are part of the only thing that is and that everybody else is a part of it with you and everybody else is a part of you. This is where compassion comes from. Breathe that in. This is where compassion comes from. Compassion comes from that awareness that there is no separation. Compassion comes from that place of the understanding that I am you and you are me. And when I do unto you, I am not doing unto something else. I am doing unto me. When I do unto you, I am doing unto all of humanity. That I'm doing unto all of humanity. Breathe that in for a moment. I'm trying to read your faces. You're tight on me now. This is good news. <laughs> this is really good news. You're not your stuff. You're not your finances. You're not your relationships. You're not the economy. You're not the politics. You're not even your own thoughts. You're the thinker. This is extraordinary. Can we use our strength remembering that? Can we use our strength living from that place? Because when I know that, there's a different place of compassion. When I know that, I am not standing in judgment. I am not standing holier than thou. A lot of our lack of compassion just comes from we're above it. Or we're beyond it. And some of it's really subtle. I don't mean to step on toes here, but some of it's really subtle in this concept of ourself as being blessed. So glad that ain't me. So glad that ain't me. Feel that? Poor you. Better off me. Glad I'm exempt from having to think about that. Glad I'm exempt from having to worry about that. Glad I'm exempt from having to do anything about that. So you say, well, I can't do everything. No, you can't. You can't farm the food here, take care of people in South Africa, we, we, you can't save the whales and raise the children. And, you know, we can't do, no one person can do all of it, right? But what you can do is imagine it all done. Listen to what I just said. You can't do it all, but does that mean it can't be done? Our mind is energy. It is powerful. It's not on us to do everything. It's on us to know it can be done. Let's just say 
there are some young people in your life. You're not their parent. Maybe you're their grandparents. Maybe you're not an uncle. Maybe these are our kids in your neighborhood or you're a mentor to or some kind of way. We don't know how every child is going to grow up, right? Not our job to figure out what is their passion or what should be their occupation, whom they should partner with in life, where they should live. Not our job, right? What our job is, is to know the best and the highest. That's our job. Our job is to see them whole, complete, satisfied, fulfilled, to lend our conscious, emotional, and psychic support. That's what we call, that's what we say holding something in consciousness, is knowing it, is declaring it, is in our heart of hearts blessing them. That's what blessing is. Are you with me? That is an act of compassion. Yes, you can physically get down in it, and if you can, help, help. But compassion doesn't necessarily mean that you have to physically be in it. It's about your heart space. D do you write folks off? Do you just not pay any attention because we have the privilege not to? And that's the heart of privilege. That's the heart of privilege, is not having to think about it. I do this exercise sometimes as a diversity trainer, where I'll be in the room and I'll ask people to think about the four or five things about themselves that are like the most important, that really shape their sense of existence and awareness in the world. I give them a few minutes. And I say, how many of you have said on your list, able-bodied? Very, very rarely does anybody say that. And then I ask them, how much of your life revolves around that? Your ability to see, to hear, to speak, to walk to move, that you have dexterity, flexibility, and mobility, and just go on and say, how much of your daily life is impacted by that? And they'll say like, 100%. So, so why isn't that on your list? And they're like, well, because I don't think about it. Why not? Why don't you think about it? You don't think about it because you don't have to. You don't think about it because everything in society is assuming that you have that, so the entire infrastructure of society is built around that. So you don't have to think about it, and that is privilege. That's the privilege right there. That everything is so designed for you that you can take your experience is so normative, project it out on everybody else, and you don't have to think about it. Have you ever been injured? Didn't the world look really different? You never noticed before how hard it was to open that door. You never really paid attention to how many steps there were. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, you never really thought about it. What side of the commode the toilet paper was on. <laughs> really? All these little subtle things, yes? Because when you're outside of it, you see it better. So let's not get upset with folks when they're bringing things to our attention. Like, well, why are you so fixated on being able to use the bathroom? Why don't you see I can't? 
perhaps might be the better question. So this place of compassion, it encompasses the both. That yes, we see the oneness that's fundamentally there, but we also see the way that it expresses in all of these different ways. And we start paying attention to making sure that all of the ways that it expresses can have access. That all of the ways in which it expresses can be fulfilled. That we're not setting up society in such a way that some ways that it expresses gets to be fulfilled more than other ways in which it expresses so that we can have a more level playing field. Yes? This is the stuff of compassion. And this is the stuff of compassion in action. And you may think, well, you know, I'm not Martin Luther King. I'm not asking to be Martin Luther King. It's the simplest of things. Our everyday actions are revolutionary. We used to say in the feminist movement, the personal is political. Whom you befriend, who you help, who you care about, who you share your goods with, your overflow, your abundance. You may think, okay, I'm cleaning out now and I'm just cleaning out my closet and like I want to get rid of this junk. What if you shifted that around for a moment and thought, you know what? I have excess stuff here that I'm not using. And this excess stuff could actually bless somebody. And I'm going to release this now so that somebody else can use this. Or I'm going to release this now, whatever, goodwill will pick it up, and there will be people with disabilities for whom will get employment in fixing some of this up and preparing it so that it can go on and serve somebody else. You change in that moment what was just a simple, I got to clean up my house and get rid of this stuff, to an act of compassion. And guess who it's going to impact first? You. You. No longer will you just be cleaning out your closet. You are turning that into a holy act. With our conscious awareness, we can make anything, cooking food, the most holy act, the most compassionate act as we're being present to serve, to share of the bounty, as we bless the earth of the cooking of it, and not just, mm -hmm, I'm making a good meal, <laughs> but that indebtedness we were talking about. How many unknown and unknown people have been a part of bringing this food here? Can I, in my mind's eye, see all of their families fed and full? The love with which I'm cooking this, can, in my mind's eye, I spread this love out everywhere? That turns your cooking into an act of compassion. When we get out of just our little self-centered me, me, me. Oh, I'm just cleaning out my closet. Oh, I just got to feed these kids. Oh, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just. And say, no. For everything that I am doing, there have been other people who have been involved in that. The food didn't just pop on my table. For all the goods that I'm getting rid of. People have been involved in this, yes? 
I'm one stop along the way in a chain, and there's something after me. There's something after me. So I take the time right where I am to bless everything that's gotten up to here, where I am now, and where it's all going, that makes me feel connected to it all. That gets me into that sense of the oneness. That gets me into that sense of being a part of something that is much bigger and makes me conscious of what I am doing. Likewise, because everything is energy, I become more aware of my judgment. I become more aware of my criticisms. I become more aware of my social media. I become more aware of, of the, what I am saying about things and the energy that I am releasing about it. I become more aware of when I am not acting from a place of compassion, which allows me to correct. You can't change something you don't see. You can't change something that you're not aware of. So when I become consciously aware that I am a field of energy that impacts everything that I do, has a rippling effect, I'm more careful with it. I'm more careful to use it consciously so that it blesses. And I'm more careful to be selective in how I use it. And I'm more likely to try to make amends and clean it up if I've done something else. No judgment, no blame, just clean up. I want to end with this little story. I think I shared it a couple of weeks ago. It moved me deeply. It was an email that was sent around, and it was talking about children. And they were asking them the question, what is love? This was a classroom of four-year-olds. And my favorite answer was this little boy, Billy. And Billy said, when people love you, they say your name different. You know your name is safe in their mouths. You know your name is safe in their mouths. There's a beautiful letter on this in the second volume of my Letters from the Infinite series, Your Deepest Intent about my name being safe in your mouth. Is everyone's name safe in your mouth? Is your own name safe in your mouth? Is the name of God or the great I am or whatever it is, is safe in your mouth? So when I say that compassion is action and you don't have to go anywhere or do anything to start it all off and to start moving in that direction, how you think, what you bless, and how you hold things in your speech. To speak, we breathe. It's like a balloon that we're blowing up. Every word makes the balloon bigger. The balloon will take up a lot of space. And then but a hot air taking up a lot of space. Our thought forms are like balloons taking up a lot of space. We need to deflate some of that stuff a little bit. Yes? So we quit breathing so much air into it. What? are you breathing life into by your thoughts and your words and your deeds? And how much of a blessing is it every day, every moment, we can make a difference? Yes? Yes. Let us pray.